I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Hannah Elliott. And this is Hot Pursuit. Okay, today we have uh, a few exciting topics that we're going to cover for you, starting with the collector car market, because Hannah has a piece, I believe, in the magazine, or at least coming out in the magazine, about an SL that's becoming more collectible. I think you can still get it for an almost affordable price or a very affordable price, but that may not last long. So we'll let you in on uh, the ground floor, so to speak. Then we're going to talk about the best car events of 2024. Hannah spends most of her life, I would guess, on planes, jetting back and forth um, between launches and car shows and races and stuff. So we're going to hear from her about uh, where you want to be this year. And then I want to talk about one of my great loves, and that is gigantic trucks that are ridiculously excessive with far more capability than I will ever need to go to Starbucks. But for some reason, I love them anyway. I'm driving the Silverado. 2500 ZR2. It's the HD, the heavy duty off road truck with a giant diesel motor and an Allison transmission. Let's start with the SL, Hannah, because you wrote a piece and where's it going to be? Where are we going to be able to read it? The story will be in Business Week magazine in a week or two. So you can find it on newsstands, but it will also be online uh, starting next week. Nice. So, yeah. All right. So, and it's about. Um, the SL, which is a car I've been hearing a lot more about lately. Last week, we talked to Kevin Tynan. I think he owns at least one, possibly two, if you count the one he gave to his son. More and more people, Doug DeMuro has been talking about it as uh, I look at lists of you know 12-cylinder cars that are still attainable, and it's always in that list, usually at the top. Talk to us about the uh, the SL. Yeah, so this is a really well-known model line that Mercedes has made from the 50s. You know, we have the Gullwing, the SL Gullwings that everyone knows about that are multi-million dollar cars. And there's, you know, a modern SL class today that I think you've probably driven. We both have driven. Love that is it. a great, yeah, I love it, love it. So it's a really long model line. This The model that specifically I focused on um, for this story were the SLs that were called R129 internally. And those were basically popular in the 90s and early 2000s. They were made between 89 and 2001 for the 2002 model year. So these are the SLs that you might have seen. Tupac driving or Michael Jordan. Princess Diana famously drove one as the first royal to not drive a British-made car, which was a bit controversial at the time. So, ah, so she was the first member of the yes. like the main royal family that uh, drove a car in public that wasn't made in Britain. <laughs> yes, and it caused quite an uproar. And in fact, Buckingham Palace had to put out a statement saying she was leasing it for personal use, but she would still drive a Jaguar for official events, um, of course, in a nod to the crown. But there are these great photos of Diana in this sort of um, raspberry, dark red uh, metallic SL, uh, and that car is now in the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart, and anyone can go see it. It's, it's a very cool piece of history. But yeah, you know, these have been really, until a few years ago, that you could get a good one for like 10000 bucks. They were not expensive at all. They looked very outdated. Um, they weren't the cool, you know, the SLs before are the cool sort of hipster 107s, they're called internally, um, that you might see in Silver Lake or Brooklyn that look very classy. These were sort of forgotten about and really cheap. Um, but we have, you know, I, when I say we, I mean these analysts that I'm talking to from Haggerty and Classic.com and even Kevin Tyne and our Bloomberg analysts, you know, they're seeing these really crop up as a very good growth potential in terms of value because you can still get them pretty cheap. Um, you can get a good one for about $20,000 now. And they really have um, the design background, the lineage, the quality, the performance um, to really make their values uh, increase even continually. I mean, there. I mean, of course, the Gullwing is legendary. Sure. Even my three-year-old daughter uh, is in love with that car. She has a little model that she plays with all the time. And then, I loved growing up as a, a kid in the '80s. I loved the the '80s version, which I always thought looked like a cigar box. Yeah. You know, and yes, it square ha- was the first car I'm aware of that, or that I was aware of that had a removable hardtop. Yes. So. You could have it in the winter with the with the rag top, and then you could put the hard top 
uh, um, I think it stands for sport light or short light. Exactly. Or sport, sport light. SL in German is basically also sport, sport light. <laughs> so, <laughs> Just say, I mean, you would know. I mean, what an awesome platform. Personally, for me, when it gets to the 90s, and that's the one that you're talking about, I didn't love that generation because it looks the 90s SL to me looks like what the 80s would have produced, you know, mm. and mm. I feel like in Spaceballs, um, the Druish princess had an SL, <laughs> although I looked back and I think she had some kind of specially designed uh, version of of the car for the movie. Um I also feel like Michael Jackson really loved that uh, that car, um, maybe because of Diana. And he, I think the SLR came, McLaren came from the next generation. But those two generations, to me, the the nineties and the and the and the aughts, they, to me, they missed the mark for the for the car, considering how well they did in the fifties, sixties, seventies, and eighties, and then now the new generation I love as well. So I get why. You can pick one up for twenty or thirty grand. <laughs> well, you you might be in the majority, and that's kind of why there's an opportunity for people who do actually like how it looked. My editor Chris Rouser, who I adore, was not a fan of them either. He, he kind of raised his eyebrow when I said I wanted to write about it. We should but point out these, that he has incredibly good taste. <laughs> he, he has impeccable taste. We would never question his taste. But I I would point out and push back a little bit because these SLs, the R129, were designed by the very distinguished Italian German engineer called Bruno Sacco who was the longtime design chief at Mercedes in the day and they really are I think aging very well they're a lot brawnier than the 107 that you mentioned before from the 80s and 70s they do look brawnier but they also had for the time really futuristic technologies an incredible V12 engine um, that, you know, I, I've spoken with many people who own the V12, per, in particular, it's this, the 600 SL, um, and they actually say it's very reliable. You know, sometimes I know that the 12 cylinders can um, have a reputation for needing a lot of maintenance, but um, I've just heard such good feedback about how reliable it is compared to other cars from the era, even. Um, maybe some of the BMWs were thrashed a bit more than the SLs, so are not as, and were not as well cared for. Um, so yeah, it, it's, uh, <laughs> you would know about BMW. that, Matt. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I wasn't going <laughs> to, that's fair. That's fair. Well, you know um, what, Kevin yeah. Tynan, uh, he knows more about motors than I ever will um, be able to learn. And he, uh, loves the 12 cylinder. Yeah. I think they had three different variations. So they had a six liter 12 cylinder yes. and that went all the way up to 7.3 liters. And I would love to drive one. Maybe I'll get into Kevin's at some point. Yeah. And I could imagine, the look growing on you. And there's actually a person in your story who bought one of these for pretty cheap. And he said, I'm, I'm really liking the design more and more as I live with it. Yes, I think that really, you know, I don't want to say it grows on you because that kind of sounds like a fungus, but it does. <laughs> it, it It's easy on the eye, especially in certain locations. I mean, Miami, L.A., these sort of sunny locales, um, Las Vegas, it, it looks... It's unusual because you might be more seeing more, you know, modern cars, but this is like a modern classic that I just think it has aged very well. And um, Brian Raybould, who is the automotive analyst for Haggerty, has uh, I spoke with him yesterday about it. And he says, look, there's still room to grow. Yeah, they've they've gained some value. Um, they've actually doubled value in the past five years, but there's still plenty of room for them to grow. Um, so yeah, interesting. Something to watch. Yeah, Haggerty actually does every year. They do. I think it's called the bull market, yes. where they pick, I guess, eight or ten cars that they think are going to appreciate in value. I love playing that game. I always loved I the BMW uh, six, the old six series, like the six thirty five CSL, or like the E thirty nine M five. I guess is an obvious one. The, the you can pick out these kind of modern classics. Um, yeah. What What do you think besides the SL? Do you have any up your sleeve that you think? Um, you can get into now for, you know, uh, f five figures that are going to be someday worth six. Um, I have to go back to the Corvette. I mean, I, I, I'm only saying this because I, I bought one for cheap and it's been so fun and it gets a lot of attention. And again, it's one of these cars where there were a lot of them. So their parts are prominent. Um, it was made for, it's been made for a long time. So it's got this history and lineage. It's got a very 
distinctive and um, well-respected design. So I think, you know, we've we've spoken about Corvettes before. I have a C3, the third generation. But even some of the later generations, I do think that you can expect that they're going to, if you get a good example, you know, of course, with, um, you know, proper maintenance and few owners and few miles and that sort of thing, you can really expect to see some growth. But, oh, you know, another one that I just thought of, what about the Ferrari FF? No, oh, I'm absolutely we, in, right? love, in love with it. Right. I, I, that's yeah. going to be interesting to watch what that does, too. If I had a spare hundred grand, I would buy one right now. Yeah. Because you can get into a pretty good, um, uh, a pretty well preserved, you know, um, version for less than that. One time I drove a Ferrari FF, uh, test drove one here for a week, and then. It was right before the Austin MotoGP race, and Mark Marquez was driving the exact same car. Cool! Um, wow! A couple weeks Impressive. later, I was I was pretty excited that my butt was where his butt was. I just love the bread van, um, you know. Look, yeah. a lot of people think they're ugly, which for oh, me, cool. I like it even better since other yeah. people think it's ugly. Of course, you're if, not basic. You're not a basic guy. Exactly. If yeah. only it had a proper stick shift. Which mm-hmm, mm-hmm. most of them are like the F1 sort of semi auto transmissions. Let's talk about events. Um, we're kicking yes. off 2024. Usually I nev- never get away from work. Now I never get away from home because I have uh, a couple babies there. But you spend all year long flying back and forth, I imagine, to Munich, to Milan, to Las Vegas. And what are the biggest events that you're focused on in 2024? It's a good question. And I would say in my old age, I really try to focus on quality instead of quantity. You know, when you're just starting out on a beat, you feel like you have to go everywhere and be everywhere and do everything and see everything. And, you know, now, especially post COVID, I'm really focusing on um, just sort of real tentpole events that you want to see, see and be seen and um, that really have big news. Um, so I, I guess, you know, we can, and I want to hear your thoughts on this too, Matt, but the first that comes to mind, just because it's this month is King of the Hammers, which <sighs> is, I mean, it's like Mad Max meets Burning Man out in the desert, um, you know, a couple hours from Los Angeles and it's, you know, a, a 10 days of, uh, million dollar trophy trucks, crawling over rocks up and down in the desert it's have you ever been i have never been but i read i think you wrote a story on it last year yeah and Mm -hmm. uh i was talking with the guys from ford about it because they um have sent trucks there obviously with the raptor and the bronco um it's like the perfect event for for them i would love you'd love it you would love it it's so cool Um, and and it's crazy because you know you you're out there and it feels real gritty and rough and you kind of forget how much money is behind it and how much money goes into these trucks and you know how much money ford spends to be there it's it's a big business that would be one of my uh bucket list trips um and if we're talking about motor events i think i would put the baja first but i don't know how you would you why is that because it's like a classic and storied race yes you know and that's uh, what ford is typically used as a proving uh, ground for their race trucks um I've never been to, I also love the Baja, by the way, sure. but I've never been to a big outdoor rally race like that. I don't know how easy it would be to see. So for me, King of the Hammers would be much more, Spectator a, a much friendly. more accessible, exactly, event to take in um, yes. because don't they, a lot of them are than track, right? Yeah, they're they're on a, a path. I mean, I would, track is maybe too strong a word, but they're on a course. And I would say you're right. Like King of the Hammers is one of the best spectator friendly off-road events. Um, you know, something like the Rebel Rally that uh, I did uh, one year in October, which is also an off-road race in Death Valley. It's very cool, and I, I love going, but it's not great for spectators. You never see anything. But you're right. King of the Hammers, uh, it's it's a set it's set courses, and you just kind of walk yourself up the side of a mountain and sit down, and you can just see, look over this vast vista of trucks and dust and, and thousands of people. It's very cool. I've never been to any. I've never been to the salt flats. You know, I've never seen all oh, this stuff. Neither have I. Ah. That would actually be. Maybe we need to plan a podcast trip there. Because we should definitely I've do not, it. You know what? That would be very. My cool. number one, I think. Um, uh, sort of off-road, and now it's mostly on-road, I think, event that I would want to see is Pikes Peak. For oh, years yeah. and years, as a um, Ducati lover, I've read about it because yes. the Multistrada you know, dominated the Pikes Peak in the motorcycle class uh, for so long. Sadly, Carlin Dunn lost his life there um, riding a Ducati. Yes. But um, 
you know, last year, Ken Block, uh, his wife went there with their daughter um, yes. as a tribute to him. Like, I, I, there's so much motorsports history at Pikes Peak. I would love to go and, and watch that. Yeah, and that is that's in June, um, toward the end of June. I, I, Pikes Peak, of course, I think they call it the oldest hill climb race in the world. It was started in 1916, and it's 12 miles and over 150 turns straight up the side of the mountain. Um, it's it's really remarkable. And the cool thing, too, that I really like is there are so many different classes about Pikes in Pikes Peak. You can watch the motorcycle guys. You can see uh, VW send up an electric Bentega SUV. You can see these guys that spend all year building their car and they just race as basically amateurs. Um, and then you see really professional drivers um, going for it, like my friend Cam Ingram um, from North Carolina. You know, he trains, he does boot camp for like four months just to do Pikes Peak. So sweet. Yeah. That yeah, would be awesome. Great, when you said mention event. hill climb, it also makes me think of the Festival of Speed. I've never been to Goodwood. Oh, yeah. July. Yes. Festival of Speed in July. That's a that's a really good one. And I've been to Festival of Speed, but I haven't been to Revival, the Goodwood Revival, which is in September. Um, I hear that one is really fun. That's the one where people dress up in period clothing. <laughs> and the whole, the whole estate, this is in England near uh, the home of Rolls Royce, of course. And the whole estate is set up into these like old timey towns and everybody dresses up. I haven't been to that one. That's in September. But yeah, Festival of Speed is kind of a can't miss thing. Very too. cool. All right. This is yeah. turning into a, a series of events that I've never been <laughs> we, to and probably won't ever get to put go them to. On the list. But put you, them on the list. But you're going to go. Is there anything else that you're yeah. looking forward to this year? Well, you know, next month um, we've got the Retro Mobile Show in Paris, which is a bunch of auctions. And for the Europeans, that's a really high end sort of she she car show. Um, I'm going to go to the ice race in Aspen with Porsche uh, also in February, which is a really big deal. Uh, they had canceled it for a few years on, a, on account of no snow, apparently, but they're bringing it back. So that's really exciting. But of course, then you have I kind of want to go to more Formula One races. We've got three next year. We've got Miami, Las Vegas and Texas. Of course, Monterey Car Week and, and Pebble Beach are really big deals. That's in August. Matt, we need to get you out. Yeah, I would love to see it. And I'll put yeah. in since you bring up the Formula One races, I'll just put in a quick plug for MotoGP because okay. I think it's when the is best. it when which uh, race it, it kicks off in March, usually in Doha, and I would love to go to Qatar to watch the race under the lights. Just an awesome series. I've seen a ton of races in Spain. I've seen a ton of races in Italy and in Austin every year. It's good fun because Americans don't really know about it. So then you get to be the only person um, who's in the pits and in the garages. And you can meet the pilots. And it's just an awesome, awesome series. If someone had never been like me and I was going to go to my first one, which one would you tell me that I should See, if you were going to go travel, I would yeah. say uh, Valencia is great at the cool. end of the season because a lot of cool. times it comes down to that race to decide the the world champion. But cool. if you're a, a Ducatisti, then you want to go to Italy and see them uh, race in Rimini. If you want to go, I would love to take you to Austin Let's do because it. that's the best place to get access. And let's uh, do it. It's super I got fun. family in Dallas anyway. I need to go down and say say howdy. Nice. All right, let's talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is big, gigantic trucks that are completely excessive. I just got into a brand new Chevrolet Silverado 2500 HD, and I know this is kind of like very far removed from your world of yes, but I want to learn hypercars and expensive, you know, classic collect collector cars. But I love. These big trucks, because they're just so luxurious, even usually in base trim, since they're unbreakable and since they're cavernous, you know, since they have more power, since they're usually towing machines than I could ever use, uh, they're just total excess. And in a city like New York, where you have to commute on roads that are just strewn with potholes and sometimes through neighborhoods where things could get thrown at you, you know, it's just great to have these urban assault vehicles. So right now, the truck I'm in has a 6.6 liter Duramax diesel uh, that puts out 975 pound feet of torque. It's just an amazing figure. Wow. It's only wow. beat, as far as I know, in the production consumer truck world by the um, Ford F- 250 that has, they have a 6.7 liter power stroke with over a thousand pound feet of torque. But at that point, it doesn't really matter, right? It's so 
smooth and refined to drive. It's shocking. Wow. You wouldn't think Not of it. Not loud. Not, Not loud. loud at wow. all. And the interior is just full of leather and every kind of digital amenity um, you, you could ever hope for. You could do conference calls in there. Obviously, you can use your laptop. Um, you, could, you could basically live out of the truck. But since it's the ZR2 version that I'm driving, and I had the uh, my last truck that I owned was the 1500 version of the ZR2, it's made for off-road um, capabilities, capabilities with these Multimatic DSSV shocks um, that first started out in racing, but now Chevy has been using in their off-road trucks. And it's just so smooth, no matter what kind of surface you're on, be it, you know... Uh, what kind of wheels is it running? Do it's got 35-inch Goodyear uh, tires, uh, the MT tires that are 12 inches wide. So they're the wow. widest tires that you can wow. get on a on a heavy-duty um, off-road vehicle, wider than the power wagon, wider than the tremor wow. package. I'm just so happy to get back into a truck. It's been a few months, um, a year maybe, since I've been in a, in a big truck. Uh, I want to get you in this truck so I can convince uh, yeah. you that they're like, they cost it you, you know? it's Yes. It, the, the power well, delivery also, it's so big and smooth. It's like Rolls-Royce-ish. I know okay, it's I have not so a Rolls-Royce. Many questions. I have so many questions. First of all, how much does the thing cost? Because it you sounds expensive. You can get expensive. into it for, I think the uh, start price is 73000 Okay. Which but is expensive, the, but it's not yes, that but expensive. The one that's you're the one driving, the, okay. I bet you. Yeah, because the $73,000 version has the gasoline engine. It's got a 6.6 okay. liter V8. This um, diesel engine adds about $10,000 to the price tag. So there you're okay. at 83. And then right. it's got options. This one is totally optioned out. So it's getting close to, it's about 90000 I think 80 oh. and change is, okay. is what it stickers at. So it's very expensive, but it's a luxury vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do people, do people look at you? So this is hilarious. I was driving in today, um, you know, down from Westchester, across Manhattan. In your came flannel down the west shirt. Side. Yeah, but yes. uh, there were a couple of very well-dressed, looked like maybe advertising exec millennial guys crossing the street. You know, like perfectly manicured beards uh, holding lattes, right? And one of them <laughs> looks at this truck and just gave me the nastiest look. <laughs> The nastiest look, and then turned to say something I'm sure demeaning to his colleague about you know my big vehicle. I don't know if it's because he thinks it's not a redneck mobile, right? Because it's uh -huh. so nice. Is the it pay, dirty at the, the fit moment? And finish. It's not dirty Is there at mud all. On it? it was just they just finished polishing it before they oh, handed God. me the keys. Um, but it's offensive to people in you know when I lived in Berlin yeah. and I drove around in the G wagon. Uh, multitudes of hipsters were offended because they just think this is a big vehicle yeah. too big for one person to use it's not environmentally friendly mm -hmm. and you know they get angry about it um yeah. but i'm just testing it you know yeah sure i I'm mean it's just you know what they it? say about assuming you know people will um buy evs that are heavier you know, oh, yeah. and I'm not sure they were much greener in the build process. Yes, there's zero tailpipe emissions, but you know, you mean the electric Hummer isn't isn't uh, no, and leafy you know, green. getting those you know children to mine your cobalt for you probably isn't <laughs> very uh, ESG either. So no. I mean, I get the concern about big gas and diesel vehicles, and I'm what on kind board. of mileage are you getting? Do you know? Uh, on the diesel? Miles per gallon, I'm looking, car and driver says 19 uh, miles per gallon on the highway. That sounds about right. You know, in my uh, in my gasoline Raptor, I was getting 13 miles oh, per gallon. Yeah. In my Challenger yeah. right now, I get about 12. Okay. So yeah. it's not so bad. The impressive thing with the Chevy Silverado HD um, ZR2 is going to be the range because it's got the diesel and it's also got the biggest tank of any of these. It's got a 36 gallon tank. So, wow. uh, you know, you're going to be able to drive 600 miles on a tank, maybe close to a thousand on a tank, no problem. And, um, that's something I'd really like to try out. I like these big trucks because you can uh, just munch miles across U.S. highways. You know, this reminds me of I, I actually drove up to Ojai uh, some months ago and I it to was Ohio? for another Ohio, Ojai, California. Oh, I see. Ojai, Cal yeah. Yes. North. North from Los Angeles. And I it was to look at a different car to look at a Jaguar. But they had an old Chevy truck for sale. 
that looked like it was about 20 feet long. And I dr just drove it because I thought it was so cool. It was like two-tone brown and cream, you know, like 1970s era, super cool truck. And But I knew the minute I got in and took off, I knew I could never have it because I could not park it anywhere. I mean, it, it would just be impossible to park. Is that how you feel well, with this? Yeah, I mean, I had the uh, that exact problem when I drove into work today. I yeah. couldn't park it in the garage that I normally park in, and I... And I, you know, used to park my Raptor there, um, and I parked my 1500 ZR2 there, no problem. So this thing is wow. even bigger than that. Parking wow. is a problem. But I'm glad you bring up the older trucks, because take a gander uh, uh, down, bring a trailer, and you'll see some yeah. really cool old pickups. I just saw a listed uh, uh, a Bronco from... I think the 80s with a 7.3 liter Godzilla um, shoehorned into it. Um, so you see a lot of really cool cars like that. People do like these old trucks and old yes. SUVs. Yes. And you know, Randy Nonnenberg, the, one of the founders of Bring a Trailer, has a real soft spot for these trucks. He owns some of them. He's sent me photos of it. We need to get him on, on, the, on the show to talk trucks with us because he, I happen to know, he secretly collects them and really has a soft spot for them. So, All right, so I'll make a convert. Put a pin you, in that. Yeah. You yet. Yeah. Yeah. Matter of time. Let's just talk about what's coming up ahead uh, in the weeks ahead. I know you're going to go and drive a special Porsche again, mm. and I want our listeners to get a little taste of what, what that is all about. Yes. Yeah, so a couple weeks ago in December, Porsche set a record for, this is very obscure, but it's for uh, the highest road going vehicle. Um, they actually went down to Chile and drove a 911 Carrera 4S up, up a mountain over 22,000 feet in the air. And this apparently set a record. So, um, They've said I can go drive that very vehicle with apparently some of the dust still on it uh, out in Malibu next Tuesday. So I'm going to do that. I guess it's an off-road course. So that'll be really fun. I'm looking forward to that. Very I'll let cool. you know how it goes. I love off-roady Porsches. Yeah. Uh, I love the, uh, the Dakar. Oh, the Dakar. Although it's ridiculously Ooh. expensive. I, I wish they would come yes. out with a more consumer-friendly version of that. I'm still upset I didn't get to go on that press drive. You know, we can't say yes to everything apparently, but I think they did it in uh, Morocco. Always say yes when Porsche invites I you to know, Morocco. I know, I know, I know. I'm still regretting that. Um, what do you have coming up that you're driving? Well, more I, trucks because of the uh, you know the lightning um, issues in the news over the last couple of weeks. How they cut production in half and the huge loss that Ford took on electric vehicles in 2023. I remembered that I'd never driven it, mm. so I want to drive the Ford F-150 Lightning. And uh, and see what I think about that vehicle. I'm sure I'm going to be impressed because it's you know a hundred thousand dollar vehicle and all said and done. And if you can't impress me with a hundred thousand dollar <laughs> truck, then you're, you've got a yeah. problem. Um, but I also want to drive some more Ford uh, vehicles. I've never driven their Power Stroke diesel, um, which I want to try out. Um, and I'd love to drive the new Mustang. Have you driven the new Mustang? No, I I really want to. That's on my list of must do for 2024. Jim Farley, you know uh, his new podcast is premiering like next week and i went back and listened to the mustang episode that he had which is really cool because that guy has been a diehard mustang fan since he was like in his teens or maybe younger i so respect that he knows everything about every generation and i was thinking like there's a lot of people who poo poo the newer ones they don't like the technology advancements um they don't like really the the progress that I guess if you want to call it progress that's made. I'm usually in that camp, but I figure with a guy like that at the helm, it's going to be good. Yeah, I mean you can't question his credentials, and you know sometimes I cringe at like there's no real definition of car guy that doesn't actually mean anything, and it doesn't mean you're good at anything or honest or or anything. It has no meaning, but there is something to be said because that about Jim Farley because we know. He's got the juice yeah. when it comes to Mustangs, whatever that even means. All right, well, that does it for this episode of Hot Pursuit. I should point out you can follow me on Instagram at MattMiller1973. And you can follow me on Instagram at Hannah Elliott XO. Two L's, two T's, two of everything. I would also mention we're working on getting something together so that we can hear from you guys. We want to set up an email and maybe even a voice recording because we do want to hear what you guys think and what you want us to talk about. So stay tuned for that. Cool. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Hannah Elliott. And this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.